One, two, three, four. <laughs> Okay, this historical audio comes from the year 2000 when uh, Chief Jim Billy of the Seminole Tribe decided to put out an album of legends. It was uh, expertly produced by John McEwen and nominated actually for a Grammy. This particular cut was recorded at the Emilio and Gloria Estevan Crescent Moon Studio in downtown Miami. We met the two owners, actually, and later visited the Versace mansion on this trip, three years after Versace was shot dead on the front steps of the mansion. But nobody really remembers a lot about the uh, recording, except that it went well, and it made it onto the, uh, the CD. Anyway, this is uh, Chief Jim Billy in The Legend of the Kissimmee River. Kissimmee River flows like a winding snake. It bends and turns all over the place. Only God knows how that river was made. But this is what the Seminoles say. It was way back then, but I don't know when. It was a long time ago. Two young men went hunting one day, and a long ways they did go. Hunting was bad. They got no food, so they stopped to spend the night. Going to sleep hungry ain't never been good, but a fire, they'll do all right. They chopped on a log to get some wood and it made a hollow sound. They cut some more. Water gushed out, two fish flopped on the ground. Hey, look at here, he yelled to his friend. Look here what we got. I'll fix them right now. You hurry and build that fire. Our stomach won't growl tonight. Throw those things away, the other one said. Something about them ain't right. Don't you remember what the old folks say? Don't mess with nothing out of place. Well, the man went ahead and he ate those fish. Hunger took his pride. I guess there always been some crazy fool who never learned to sacrifice. The hunters went to sleep by the warm fire. Everything seemed all right. The strangest thing happened to the one who ate those fish that night. His body got long and his legs disappeared. He took a slow, deep breath. It woke up his friend and what he saw scared him half to death. The thing was scaly and it was so big his head was above the trees. His tongue flickered out when he called for his friend. Where are you? Please help me. I can't believe this has happened to me. I know it's what I ate. You've got to go and tell my folks. I'm turning into a snake. Well, the friends of the snake somehow ran home in a day. When he told the folks what happened to the man, they thought it was just a joke. Some cried, it's a lie, he's murdered the man. Cause his story is hard to believe. But the mother of the man said, show him to me. And the villagers all agreed. Well, they traveled long ways, and they found the place, but the snake had crawled away. They wanted to see him, so they followed his trail down to this great big lake. They were all amazed at the size of the lake, and they wondered how wide it was. They sent a young man up a cypress tree, and he told them, Okichumbe. Meanwhile, the snake laid low in the cool, dark water watching the people on the shore. He wished somehow he could change his life and be a man once more. The friend gave a holler, and he hollered four times, hoping the snake was nearby. Then in one smooth move, the snake came out. Everyone was surprised. I hope it's you, his good friend said, because they think I'm telling them a lie. Yes, it's me, the snake told me. I'm glad you all arrived. The snake looked around with his tongue flickering out. He could see they were terrified. He said, Don't be afraid. I'll 
explain how this whole thing came about. The omen of the land can be bad or good. You must never challenge, but if you should, you've got to remember you have no choice between sorrow and joy. I've come to peace with what I am, because there's others just like me. They live in the sea way down in the deep, where no man has ever been. I'll see you again when the earth is old, and at the end of this world. It was the curse of the fish, the old folks said, that made him wander to the lake. And where the big snake crawled, he left a deep groove, and a winding river was made. So Kissimmee River flows like a winding snake. It bends and turns all over the place. Only God knows how the river was made, but this is what the Seminoles say. Let it wind like a snake to Okeechobee Lake. This is what the Seminoles say. Kissimmee. Chinchino Fashkin, Omechon. Betty May Tiger Jumper was Director of Communications for the Seminole Tribe of Florida. Born in 1923 at the tribe's Indian Town Camp, she grew up on the Hollywood Reservation where she became fluent in English and Creek besides her native Miccosukee language. Though she did not begin formal schooling until the age of 14, she was the first Seminole Indian to graduate from high school, and she was very instrumental in the incorporation of the Seminole tribe into a federally recognized tribe, helping to draft the Constitution and to explain to the other Indians, many of which uh, spoke different languages, Creek and Miccosukee, what was going on. In 1991, she was able to obtain a Florida Department of Health and Rehabilitative Services Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Grant. It was matched by the Seminole Tribe of Florida when James Billy was chairman to produce a first a cassette, later a VHS, of Seminole Indian legends remembered by Betty who collected them all her life. She was known as the tribal st storyteller. She appeared at folk festivals all over the country giving Seminole Indian legends. And this particular legend uh, is uh, one of her favorites, and it's called The Corn Lady. Listen to the voice of Betty Mae Tiger Jumper. Legends and stories have been told throughout the Indian country, and each tribe has their own type of story pertaining to their country. How the possum lost his tail, how the fox became to be the color he is, even the, even the raccoon how he got the bandit stripes on its eyes how these animals bragged about who can last the longest without drinking water, and she will tell you which ones survive. Some of the other stories that I particularly like is how each animal got its name, like Wakachobe, the big one that goes walk, walk. And right away, that's the great blue heron. And Betty Mae Jumper knows a lot of these stories, and she's gonna share, share them with you, so I hope you will enjoy them. There was once a family living at the edge of the big forest. The swamps were full of meat and fish, and there were places for people to grow vegetables, pumpkins, potatoes, beans, and tomatoes. They also raised pigs and cows. They were happy people with no worries. They had everything. The children were always playing and swimming in the ponds near the camp. They would run around and chase each other and play hide and seek. One day, the older sister of a child put her brother down to play with the smaller children while she played with the older ones. She played a long time and forgot about him. When she finally went to check, he was gone. She called and called his name, but he was nowhere to be found. The unhappy big sister ran to tell her mother, and soon all the women of the village were searching. They kept this up until sundown, but were still unable to find the baby. 
The men of the village returned from a hunting trip and were told the baby was missing. They looked for the child well into the night, but couldn't find him. The father of the baby sent for the wise medicine man. Since he lived quite a distance away, it took him two days to get to the village. When he finally arrived, he asked everyone to sit down and then told them about the unseen people that live on the small islands in the swamps. He believed that they had picked up the baby and run off with him. He told the village that they could not find these unseen people, and though he felt the baby was alive somewhere in the glades, it would not be possible to find him. The family was very sad but gave up looking in all hopes of ever seeing the baby again. Years went by. Out in the jungle, in the heart of the Everglades, was a little island. No one from the village had ever been there. An old witch, so ugly you wonder where she had come from, lived there and had a young boy living with her. The witch loved the boy and she had raised him well. Every day she would prepare corn softy and vegetable for him and he grew up to be a strong teenager. The cap had once been very beautiful with three chickies, one for the campfire, one for sleeping, and one for eating. The chickies had grown old though and were falling apart, and the boy asked daily why he was not allowed to repair them. The old witch knew that someday she would have to tell him the truth about himself, that this was not his real home. This made her very sad because she knew that this day was very near. The boy wondered where she got the corn she prepared for him, since he never seen it grow like the other vegetables, but she would never tell him. All he knew was that there was always plenty of corn to eat. One day the boy decided he would follow the old witch and find out where she got it. He pretended to be asleep when she checked on him and stay in the shadow behind her as she got her basket and walked toward the swamp. She walked quite a distance to a cool running stream where she stepped in and scrubbed her legs until they were very clean. A little farther on, she sat on a log, dry her legs and start rubbing them from the knees to the ankle until beautiful yellow corn fell into her basket. She continued doing this until it was full. On the way back, she stopped and filled up another basket with white sand. The boy who had been watching her all the time ran past her while she did this, got back into the chicky and jumped into bed. When the witch returned, he was pretending to be asleep. As he watched, she built a fire and torched the corn in the sand in the iron pot. She then placed the corn in a log, which was about two feet from the ground. The log was about seven feet long and 12 inches round. She pounded the corn up and down until it was ground into a cornmeal. When breakfast was ready, the old witch called the boy to come and eat, but he refused. The old woman went to where he lay, looked at him and said, you know, don't you? The boy didn't answer, and she asked again. Finally, he told her that he had followed her that morning and had seen everything. She told the boy that she had known this day was near, and she began to cry. Yes, my son, she said, 
You have given me much happiness all these years, but it is now time you return to your people. She then told him of how she had taken him years ago when he was a baby, and she told him the name of his family. Then she gave him the necklace he had been wearing when she stolen him. I am an old woman and my time is drawing near, she said. You must do as I say. Leave and don't look back. Tonight when the sun goes down, you must go to bed and sleep. When you wake up past midnight, you must go. Go east toward the sun and go past two big forests on the other side of the big lake. This is where your people live. It will take you two and a half days to get there. Now sleep, my boy. You have a lot of walking to do. When you get up, pick up the fire and throw it all over the chickies and run. Follow the trail we have walked many times and run, run, run. The boy began to cry, but she scolded him. Don't cry. We have had many wonderful years together and I have enjoyed seeing you grow into a fine boy. Get yourself a pretty girl and marry among your own people. The boy knew she meant well for him. She had been good to him and taught him everything he knew, including how to hunt. Though it saddened him, he knew he would have to do as she said. Past midnight, he got up, his heart heavy, and did as the old woman had told him. He threw the fire on the chickweed and stopped running. He ran until he was very tired, then walked the rest of the night. At daybreak, he passed the first big forest, and by evening, as he neared the second big forest, he was very tired. He knew he was near his village, and he wanted to rest before he saw his people. So he found a big oak tree and climbed up about middle way to a large branch that looked like a saddle. He could sleep there without falling out of the tree. At sunrise, he woke with the birds singing around. Climbing down from the tree, he picked berries to eat as he was very hungry. After he found fresh water to drink, he continued on his way. He walked until he reached the big lake, which the old woman had told him about. The men from the village were on their way out hunting, and he quickly jumped out of the sight as he didn't want to meet them yet. When he saw many chickies ahead, he knew he had arrived. He climbed up in a tree and watched the people until almost sundown. He wondered what he would say to the people about where he had lived all these years. Finally, he climbed down from the tree and walked to the edge of the village. The children saw him and yelled, New man, new man, visitor, the older man of the village, came out to shake his hand and talk to him. When he told them about himself, the old man remembered the story of little baby who'd been lost long ago. The boy then gave one old man the necklace he had been wearing when he disappeared. Yes, yes, cried the man, I know your family. Slowly they walked to the other side of the village. There sat a man and a woman talking. The old man placed the necklace in the woman's hand. She stared at the beadwork for a long time, then looked up to say she knew the work. The old man told her that this was her son who had been lost so many years ago. The story was told over and over to everyone who joined the happy family around the campfire. They sat and listened all night long to the boy's story. After many months, the village men decided to go and see where the boy had been raised. They left early one morning and were gone for about a week. When they returned, they told that where the boy had been raised 
all over the island was now a patch of beautiful green leaf corn. Everyone went to see the corn, which was so yellow and pretty. The men gathered all the corn they could carry and took it back to the village with them. They saved the seed and planted them year after year. The green corn dance was held annually by the people to thank the Great Spirit for their blessing after this discovery. This is where the Indians got their corn. Will McLean, who was born in 1919 and died in 1990, uh, was a Florida folk singer-songwriter, really the patriarch of Florida folk music. He was the first one of us Florida songwriters to become famous. He traveled around the country. Uh, he made friends with Pete Seeger. He even played Carnegie Hall. He was inducted into the Florida Artist Hall of Fame in 1996 and wrote arguably more than 3,700 songs and stories always telling his audiences, my soul is a hawk. Three of his most important songs were Hold Back the Waters of Lake Okeechobee, Wild Hog, and Ballad of the Green Turtle. A weekend music festival is held every March uh, up in Central Florida called the Will McLean Music Festival after the great singer-songwriter. Uh, he's been gone for a while, and uh, those of us that remember him, of course, we miss him. Uh, his song lyrics, correspondence, photographs, recordings, all his artifacts, such as his guitar, harmonica, and black hat, and the Florida Artist Hall of Fame Award are preserved in the special collections area at the University of Florida, George A. Smathers Libraries. And a collection of photographs of Will are maintained in an archive kept by the state entitled Florida Folklife Collection. Here is Will McLean telling the story of the Blunt's Fort Massacre and a song telling the same story, showing his skill as a balladeer Will McLean. Outside of a few exceptions, the rivers and lakes of Florida have kept the names given them by the Indians. They sound musical when properly pronounced. Escambia, Choctahatchee, Chattahoochee, Wakulla, Oglockney, Awistlacoochee, Wekiva, Okeechobee, and the Sewanee, immortalized by Stephen Foster. The most beautiful river of them all is the Oklawaha, now doomed by the Cross State Barge Canal. These are a few of the more well-known streams, but historically, the most significant river in the state is the Apalachicola, one time called the breadbasket of the South. Long before the Spanish discovered Florida, Indian villages were scattered along this waterway. The rich soil produced vegetables for the communities, the forest and river gave meat and fish. The people lived in harmony and peace. In later years, before Georgia was formed and named, slaves from the Carolinas would manage to escape, eventually making their ways to one of the villages along the Apalachicola, where they would be accepted into the tribe. Through intermarriage and prolific breeding, their numbers increased rapidly over the following several generations and these mixed bloods would be referred to as exiles. In the year 1814, two British ships anchored in Apalachicola Bay and began discharging men and equipment. Lieutenant Colonel Nichols was officer in charge of this expedition. Their purpose, find a site upriver and build a fort to control this strategic waterway. 30 miles from the mouth of the river, they built a strong fort fully stocking it with cannon and smaller arms. They had no qualms that this was Spanish territory. The British suddenly evacuated this fort, going downriver to waiting ships and embarkation, leaving behind to the bewilderment of the exiles a complete arsenal of powder and weaponry. Andy Jackson, after his victory at New Orleans, was appointed commanding general with jurisdiction as far south as the territorial border. From his headquarters at Nashville, Tennessee, Orders were issued to Sailing Master Loomis at Mobile, Alabama, and an Army officer, Colonel Clinch, stationed at a post on the Flint River. The orders stated that this Negro fort posed a threat and must be destroyed in all haste, and immediately thereafter returned the captured slaves to their rightful owners. Colonel Clinch, with troops and Indian allies, embarked downriver. By midday July 25, 1816, his troops were deployed, the cannon in place near the stronghold. 
Sailing Master Loomis left Mobile Bay with two gunboats and sailed upriver to anchor just below the fort. He was at battle stations by the 25th. Word of their coming had preceded the army, so by the time of its arrival, 334 exiles had fled to the fort for safety. After short conference, Loomis and Clinch began shelling the fort, and for two days they kept it up, the balls having little or no effect against the thick walls. Another conference was held and a decision reached. The gunboats would this time use hot shot or heated cannonballs. The shelling was resumed. Over the walls, they lobbed the sizzling hot shot. One ball reached the powder magazine, and a resultant explosion killed 270 of the exiles outright and badly wounded most of the others. This episode brought about the first Seminole War. Apalachicola River stood a fort Built by British engineers with cannon in each port Protection from the slave forays that caused the exiles dread Then they left it to the men whose color was of red Black men came from South Carolina and Georgia filled with hope To seek this peaceful haven no more to wear the yoke here the exiles lived and died, and from the heart gave thanks For this golden fruitful land along the river's banks But the mighty force of greed reached out on every hand This Negro fort must be destroyed, the slaves you will disband Return them to their rightful owners, so the orders said I'm sixty miles from Georgia's line Blunt's fort was blown to shred. Where the Flint and Chattahoochee join and flow to sea, Colonel Clinch from here did go, and many men had he. And from the Gulf the gunboats came with Loomis in command. There's no escape from Doom Blunt's fort by water or by land. Now the fort's surrounded and the shelling has begun. Cannonballs a thudding, smoke near hides the sun. On and on for two full days, and then before nightfall, Loomis said to Colonel Clinch, we'll give him red hot ball. White hot balls are whizzing, see the fiery way they glow. O'er the walls are bouncing, skittering to and fro. Straight into the powder magazine, this ball it went. Night was struck asunder with a hellish rain. Blood and gore and bodies torn are flying everywhere, and the stench of burning flesh fills evening air. Oh, you lost three hundred, woman, child, and man. You did never fire one shot, nor lift an angry hand. Now the river quietly runs by where the spirits sleep Past the side of old Blount's fort where the willers weep From this dark deed sprung the fires that set this land aflame It burned in the soul of the Seminole And the bitter war it came This is a version of Wild Hog uh, being played by Bobby Hicks, the great Florida songwriter. And this was uh, recorded, I guess, at the uh, Florida Pioneer Festival. And Bobby tells a, a cute story about a very, very rough uh, song, The Wild Hog. I don't know if you heard him mention Will McLean earlier. Will McLean was, he wasn't the first Florida songwriter, but he was one that made the songs interesting enough that people really wanted to hear them and, and really opened the door for those of us that only wrote Florida songs. And uh, so I think I should at least honor Will by doing a Will McLean song while I'm up here. And uh, we lost Will January 18th, 1990. So uh, we'd lost him many times before, but this last time was for good. Yeah. <laughs> Will McLean would gamble Rogers in his 
and his entourage went up and played Carnegie Hall as a guest of Pete Seeger back in the 1969 and afterwards Lady Rothschild there in Pelham Manor, New York had them over to her house to sample a 50 year old bottle of brandy. Anyway, while they were there, one of these self-appointed or self-anointed, however you want to look at it, ethno-folk musicologists jumped up and asked Mr. Will McLean if he might if he might ingratiate the, the crowd of Yankees up there with one of his Florida songs. And so Will Will began to play this song called Wild Hog. And uh, it, it was it was about a song about his grandfather, actually. His grandfather had a horse taken out from underneath him by a hog back over around Gulf Hammock, and Will wrote the song about it. One horrific porker, as Will would say. But anyway, as, as they begun to play the song, this self-appointed ethno-folk musicologist jumped up and said, singing about the wild hog, Mr. McLean has represented the lost innocence of man, my mind, since birth, and how the blood of Jesus washed him clean, all this. And Will just stopped right in the middle of the thing, looked at Gamble Rogers and said, Hell, Jim, the song's about a damn pig. <laughs> so, you know, we don't need an ethno-folk musicologist to translate our words for us. These crackers, we're talking straight, folks, the only way we know how. Fearsome evening, pretty near the setting sun. I wasn't thinking, I got careless, didn't even tow the gun. There he was, his red eyes burning, slobber running down his jaw. I never see a sight so fearful, chill me to my very mall. brown and yellow sand. Sometimes at night I get to thinking and the shivers colds my spine. Oh, that's a Will McLean line. Instead of saying the shivers rolled up and down your spine or anything, the shivers colds my spine. Listen to that. Boy, that ain't a cracker talking. Sometimes at night, I gets to thinking, and the shivers colds my spine. I walks out into that moonlight, that old hog still on my mind. There's a wild hog in Gulf Hammer. You know, I'm a native Floridian, and as, as native Floridians that have gro grown up in the, the last couple of decades, I guess, just can't imagine the life that Florida residents lived many years ago, when, uh, especially in the interior of Florida, far from the beaches and the highways or anything else, you had people that are living, like you might imagine, um, folks in rural Georgia or Alabama or Mississippi. It was, it was the South. Make no mistake about it, Florida was the deep South. And uh, up there in uh, Inverness and Williston and those towns in the middle of Florida, uh, if you wanted to go and have uh, pork, a lot of times you'd have to do what Irene Russell Green tells us in this uh, story. Uh, you have to go out and uh, slaughter yourself a hog. This was life in Florida back in those frontier days. Yeah, the hog killing story is really something else. You know, you don't just go out and wake up one morning and say, I'm going to kill a hog. That's not how we did it. <laughs> it took a couple weeks of planning because Daddy would have to set up these tables, you know. After you got the hogs butchered, you'd have to have a table to lay the hog on where you could cut it up. 
So he'd start like two weeks ahead of time, you know, getting everything ready. And then they'd probably kill at least four at a time. He would take and pin those hogs up because Mama said she wanted those hogs cleaned out before she put any of that pork in her mouth. <laughs> so she would have Daddy to feed him just corn and a hog feed for at least two weeks. And that way, you know, she could tell if one of them was a little puny or sickly. She wouldn't want to eat it. She wouldn't let Daddy kill it. Mm -hmm. So they'd start the hog killing early on Saturday morning. My brothers, my brother-in-law, and my daddy, they'd get out there, and Daddy would go out there. He'd have those four hogs in a pen with his 12-gauge shotgun, and he would shoot them in the head one at a time when he got one shot all the rest of the hogs just went crazy mm. it's such a noise you just don't want to hear it he would take that hog and drag it out of the pen and then cut its throat and let it bleed out and then you'd have to keep the dogs off of it the dogs are yapping and carrying on wanting to go eat the hog so you're chasing dogs everywhere <laughs> Oh, I got so mad at those crazy dogs. So they do <clears throat> one hog at a time. And they had these big old wash pots full of boiling water. That when they got the hog through bleeding and decided it was dead enough, they'd stretch it out on the table, cover it up with burlap sacks, and then pour that hot water over them. And let it sit there for a little bit. And then they had these very sharp knives. They would shave the hair off the hogs. The skin would be so smooth, you wouldn't find a hair on it. And then Daddy would take and hang it up on a scaffold, take this big old knife and start at the throat and cut it down in the belly and start pulling all the insides out of it. And one wash tub would be nothing but the intestines and the liver and lights and the heart but they'd give the heart to the dogs to eat they didn't cook that and then they'd start cutting it up <laughs> and then they had all this belly fat they'd cut a big old slab off of it and they'd give it us children that we would have to cut up <laughs> to make crackling side up well you can imagine the feel of that fat it was hot just coming out of that freshly killed hog it was slimy <laughs> And they was rushing us because you had to hurry up and get through with all this stuff before you could start on the other hog. So one day I remember I'm sitting there and I'm cutting this hog fat. And I was getting so mad. The flies are buzzing around everywhere. <laughs> and I was so tired. And I thought, nah, I'm going to take care of this. And I had this old dog and her name was Hattie. And God bless her. She was ugly as sin, but I looked around. I didn't see Daddy looking at me or Mama looking at me, and I called that dog over there to me. I said, here, Hattie. And I <laughs> threw down a big slab of fat to her, and she got in her mouth, and I kicked her where she could run. <laughs> she took off. And I thought to myself, well, you get through with that, there's more to be had, so come on back. <laughs> so finally get through cutting all that fat and stuff and then all that stuff goes in a wash pot and it cooks out and it, all your grease, hog lard and all the cracklings that come to the top and daddy would take the hams get them in the smokehouse and start smoking them and the other meat he would take down to the the ice plant there in Williston and they would make a ground up sausage links and uh, some of the meat they would uh, keep in the freezer there at the ice plant but of course daddy didn't have the money to pay them to keep that money that meat in the freezer so he just paid them with a a ham or a rack of ribs or something like that off the hogs everything about that hog was eaten from intestines to pigtails my mother and my sister would start cleaning those nasty hog guts, titlins as they're called, and they would go straight to the stove and start cooking them, along with pigtails, 
and pig feet. It was really a nasty job to have to do. This is a video of Diamond Teeth Mary performing at the uh, what they call the Actors Workshop at a theater down in uh, Palm Beach County uh, on October 5th, 1986. She had been performing in her second career for about four or five years at that point. And uh, after having been retired since the 1960s when her medicine show that she performed with for years uh, ran out of gas in Florida in uh, the Manatee County area. And then she had been living there until she was rediscovered and brought to the Florida Folk Festival in 1981. So here we are in 1986 and she's uh, has a favorite so uh, story that she told almost every single time she performed. It was the good son, bad son story. It's almost like a, a fable, <laughs> um, a legend, and she has a song that goes with it, and it's called, and she, in which she sings, Don't Drive Your Mother Away. This is a very rare uh, video and probably the only known copy of this performance, but this is Diamond Teeth Mary McLean. She was 85 years old, um, and she's with her uh, band, the, uh, the uh, King Snake Blues Band from St. Petersburg, singing uh, Don't Drive Your Mother Away. Some good news about us sitting back there in the dressing room. The nose, as you we all we got a lot of nose, we got to be nosy. So I heard Eric say that his mother and father's here tonight. I think that's a wonderful thing for your parents to follow their children and see what they're doing. So to that child that they love him. Let's give his mother and father a good beginning as they stand. Thank you, God. He's just 23 years young. I started working with him when he was 18. They know he ain't nothing but a baby. Let's give him another great big hand. <laughs> so I have a number. If I don't do it, some of you'll kill me. So <laughs> I expect I better try to do it right now. <laughs> My throat's messed up so bad. But I'm dedicating this number to Eric and his mother and father. Ladies and gentlemen, these things are going on today. Not of yesterday, day before yesterday, today. These things, if you look around and visit around and go to some homes, you see the same thing that I'm telling you is going on right now. Maybe in some of you families, you never know. But what I'm going to say to you is going on now. I know a lady. He had two sons. Mm. One was a real refined young man, and one was no good as usual. He turned out to be a wino. So the uncle's brother, he became a doctor. So he told his mother, he says, Mother, <coughs> I didn't have to grow up young, grow up to be a young man. I'm going to take care of you just like you took care of me. Because you have worked yourself to death for me. And I want you to know how much I appreciate that. But that wine was gone about his business with his boss. He wasn't thinking about mama, brother, sister, nobody else. Okay, he got married. So he said to his mother, he said, Mother, I'm married now. I got two little girls. And I want you to come and help me to raise my children just like you raised me, to be open and kind and neat to everybody. Humble is the way. Politeness is the way. But the young people out there don't know how to respect nobody. They don't even respect a brick, not only a human. They'll kill that brick if that brick say no. If they can. So when the kids grew up some size, his wife went to him and says, Honey, I want to talk to you. You don't have to get rid of your mother because she's gotten too old. She can't raise the children. She's talking bad language, this and that. And I don't want that to rub off on my children. So he ignored her. He ain't paid no mind. 
So he wanted a third time like the same question. So she had one of the old fashioned rocking chairs. She said, mm hmm I know this will help me after a while. So she was sewing, she just hung, kept on going, doing a little sewing. So he kept on going and said, you've got to go, mother, I'm sorry. I'm gonna put you in a nursing home, give you a nice radio, TV, telephone. You have nothing to worry about, and you have a nurse around you every day around the clock. I'll come see about you every day, but you lied. So finally, she decided she would go. She went back to the room, got a little bag, packed it up, got in his fine Cadillac car, took out down the road. So she kept a little lady. She didn't say a word, her eyes was washed away. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Her eyes was washed away in tears. So finally she looked back, she said, wait a minute. Stop this car right now. I believe I see that no good son of mine coming behind me. So they stopped the car, he jumped up. He said, mother, where are you going? She said, I don't know, honey. Your rich brother got tired of me. And so they did. I'm gonna take me to the nursing home. He said, no, 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 no. Says you ain't gonna take our mother nowhere. That's the no good boy. That's what the it's a, it's the ladies and gentlemen, it's good. It's some good in everybody. I don't care how bad they are, it's some good about some good quality about them somewhere. He said, No, mother, you not going no rest home. He said, Mother, I don't have no fine home. It's all broken down. It leaks. But if you don't mind, you can come home and sleep with me. He said, Mother, I don't have no food. I eat out of the can. I got some pork and beans, if you don't mind. But eat these pork and beans together. This is a no good boy. He said, you see, I don't have a good car. I got old pork and jalopy. But Mother, wherever I go, you can go. You ride in this old car with me. She looked around, she looked around, and she looked at her son. Your rich son, set in that fine car. And she looked at him. And she went back to him. And she touched him like this. I'm your mother, don't drive me away. <laughs>
Robert Russell Chubby Wise, born October 2nd, 1915, passed away January 6th, 1996, was one of the greatest American bluegrass fiddlers. He began playing fiddle at age 15, working locally in the Jacksonville area, joined the Jubilee Hillbillies in 1938, and then began playing with Bill Monroe's Bluegrass Boys in 1942, including at the Grand Old Opry. In fact, the years that he was with Bill Monroe, the banjo player was Earl Scruggs, the guitar player was Lester Flatt, and of course Bill played the mandolin. It was considered the greatest bluegrass band of all time. He was a Florida native, born in Lake City. Uh, he played in bands with Hank Snow, recorded with uh, Mac Wiseman, Red Allen, even even Hank Williams Jr. He, his uh, recordings, his fiddle can be heard on some of Hank's songs. But his most famous song, the, the most famous song connected with him is the Orange Blossom Special, arguably the most famous fiddle song. In fact, it's a just a uniquely uh, Florida fiddle song. It talks about a train that went from New York down to Miami, as the lyrics say, and uh, took uh, oranges and grapefruits up north and tourists back down south. And um, I've, I've felt over the years that it, that it had a bad reputation because they don't allow fiddle players to play the Orange Blossom Special at fiddle contests because it's considered a trick song. And uh, I don't know, I think it had something to do with the fact that Florida was a little bit late getting into the national bluegrass uh, scene and some of these guys from Kentucky and Appalachia were very unwilling to let the music uh, travel around like it has done and it's, it's all over the world now and uh, they just tried to keep that song out but the song was written according to uh, Chubby and you, he, what, what I have here now is at the 1993 just a few years before he died 1993 Fire on the Swamp Festival that I used to produce for the uh, Seminole tribe at, on the Big Cypress Seminole Reservation the Fire on the Swamp Festival which Chubby, we called him up and he came down to play at and we also made him the judge of the Big Cypress National Fiddle Championship. And uh, we sat down with him one day, myself and Leslie Gaines, a filmmaker, and we asked, you know, there's always been controversy about how this song was written. The co-writer is Erwin T. Rouse, another Florida songwriter who came came out of South Florida. And uh, what's the true story about how this song was written? And this is what he had to say, Chubby Wise. Tell me the story about how you learned how to play, the, or how you wrote the Orange Boston Special. Well, the late Urban Rouse and I, in 1938 or 39, I couldn't be sure what year it was. Uh, we were good friends, and we were down at the Union Station in Jacksonville right after the Orange Blossom Special came on the seaboard. And we were talking about that train. And uh, on the way home, Irving went and had breakfast with me that morning. And on the way home, he said, let's ride a fiddle dude and call it the Orange Blossom Special. And we sat on the side of my bed at 809 East Adams Street. I don't even remember the address. And we wrote that fiddle tune in about 40 minutes. And Irvin said, sure, we said, uh, let's go down and have it copyrighted. And of course, that was back in the Depression days. And I said, Irvin, I don't have time to fool no fiddle tune. I've got to check on my cab and, t and uh, try to make some money to feed my family with. So I said, if you can do anything with that fiddle tune, it's all yours. And he did something with it, I think. <laughs> so that's how the Art Blossom Fisher was born, right there. And now, now, I had nothing to do with the words. That was just a melody. He and his brother Gordon wrote the words to it. How does it make you feel when, when you get people's reaction on that song? Well, I'm grateful that I was lucky enough to take part in writing a, a fiddle tune that turned out to be the biggest fiddle tune that was ever written. And I guess we'll be the top fiddle tune as long as there is such a thing as music. Uh, it's been recorded by, I understand, over 100 different artists. Uh, of course, Johnny Cash recorded it. And it's been a numerous amount of the big time people recorded it. Well, I can't remember the name of the band, but there was one of the big time bands with about 30 pieces and it recorded the Orange Blossom Special. So Irvin and I, it's like I always say, Mother Nature didn't just smile at us, she laughed out loud when we wrote that out there for sure. We were lucky. Did you get any royalties from that at all? I don't. He did. Yeah. Of course, Irvin's been dead, as you know now, about 10 or 12 years, but his family still gets the royalties. Mm -hmm. See, my name's not even on it. Like I say, I just gave him my half of it. Uh, that was my biggest mistake that I've ever made in the music business is for finance the end of it. But it didn't hurt my statue any. I'm, like I say, I'm grateful that I was lucky enough to take part in writing because it's really opened a lot of doors for me in the business, you know. One more, we'll do the Orange Blossom. Orange Blossom. We've got another show coming out later on. Never we got times about up, we allotted for so much on each show. And I'll be back with you again. I'll be this at about seven for another 30 minute performance. And 
fellow Smaggy was such a fine job. It's been a long time since we've been on the stage together, but we certainly haven't forgot how. And uh, I had a lot of requests to do one of the gentlemen done it there. He kind of turned it around and wrote a little extra in it. But some folks wanted to hear it all just the way Irvin and I wrote it. And certainly by now you know what I'm talking about. I'm just grateful that I was lucky enough to take part in writing this one. And I hope you enjoy my rendition of the old Orange Blossom special. So I'll tell you what, Tommy, fire it up and we'll take a ride if you're ready, buddy. One, two, three, let go. To find out more about the Florida Folk Show podcast, go to floridafolkshow.com. You can also find us at anchor.fm slash floridafolkshow. You can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also subscribe to the Florida Folk Show podcast channel on YouTube and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. You can find all of those links and much more at floridafolkshow.com.